Alexander II's reign began in a very similar fashion to that of his father. Uh, he was trying to take advantage of a rebellion in England to win back land in the north of England that had been lost by Scotland. Uh, John, he was facing a rebellion from his barons, and when they took London in 1215, uh, he was forced to sign the Magna Carta, which is a landmark document in the development of parliamentary democracy. The Magna Carta curtails a lot of the king's more arbitrary powers. Uh, it says that the king's not above the law of the land and entitles all free men to a trial. It's basically the birth of the lawyer, which is why it's so celebrated in America. You know, the whole thing was written in Latin, kind of like a, a Boris Johnson public health announcement, although a 13th century document written entirely in Latin is still easier to understand and interpret than one of the bloody shit shows. And John, he was never realistically going to follow through with the Magna Carta like King John I. King John Un, fighting for democracy. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> That's the last time I'm going to do that joke, I promise. I promise. Uh, Alexander's attempt to take a advantage of the situation it didn't go very well. John easily put down his insurrection at Berwick. So Alexander, he turned his attentions to the Western Isles, um, which had been under Norse control, Viking control, since the turn of the 12th century. But there have been a lot of Celtic rebellions there. Um, one of the most famous Celtic heroes from Scottish history is a, a warlord, a Celtic warlord called Summerled. Summerled fought against the Vikings. Uh, he fought against the feudal system. And he created a title for himself, Lord of the Isles. Um, which is actually a position that I applied for at Tesco's yesterday. Uh, well, you know, they, they say customer assistant, I say Lord of the Isles. Tomato, tomato. You know? uh, and a lot of Scotland's most predominant clans uh, claim heritage from Summerled, like the MacDonalds, the McDougalls and the McAllisters. And apparently over half a million people can trace their lineage back to Summerled, which I think is amazing for a guy from the Western Isles, a part of the world which is famed for having very few gene pools. You know, oh, 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 McLeod, 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 McLeod. They're all called McLeod over there. Um, and so, uh, Hack on the Fourth, he was the king of Norway. Sounds like the bad guy that you, you have to fight at the end of a computer game level, doesn't it? He refuses to negotiate with Alexander. He'd got a taste for black pudding. He wasn't going to give it up that easily. Um, and so, Alexander, he amasses a force to attack Hakon's vassal, king of the Isles, uh, at Dunstaffenage Castle is about four miles north of Oban. And uh, the night before he's about to launch his attack, he's visited in a dream by St. Olaf, St. Magnus and St. Columba, who urge him to retreat. Uh, and Alexander, he ignores their advice, because, I mean, fuck it. Fair play to him, do you know what I mean? Like, we don't want our world leaders taking advice from dreams, um, which is even less advisable than Dominic fucking Cummins, for Christ's sake. Um, but the next morning, Alexander dies. His fleet is disbanded. And his son is crowned Alexander III at Schoon Palace at aged only nine years old. And just a year after Alexander's coronation at Schoon, Margaret, Margaret Canmore, she was elevated to a saint, she was canonised. So Alexander's uh, coronation was seen as a blessing because here was a Scottish king who was now descended from a saint. I too, by the way, am also descended from a saint. Uh, it was one of the ways in which uh, my mum sugarcoated telling me that I was adopted you know uh, apparently my dad is a saint and a janitor so you know that's exciting and once again Hakon he refuses to negotiate the return of the Western Isles to Scotland and when he hears that Alexander plans on taking them by force he amasses the largest army to ever leave Norway in 1263 and what comes next is the Battle of Largs uh, the Viking fleet they anchor themselves in Lamlash Bay and Isle of Arran and the night before the battle, eh, Hakon, he makes his men do a, a pre-ritual war dance uh, called the Hakon. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, the Battle of Largs, it wasn't really a battle at all. It was more a kind of series of, of skirmishes. There was a lot of kind of very violent hand-to-hand -hand combat on the beach at Largs and the kind of burning and looting of ships. And the people of Ayrshire, they actually commemorate the Battle of Largs every single weekend uh, by burning, looting and fighting each other. There was no real kind of winner in the Battle of Largs, but Hakon, he was forced to retreat to Orkney and in a strange twist of fate, uh, he died on the same day that Alexander's son was born. And the Battle of Largs is the Vikings' last stand in Scotland before we sent them homeward to negotiate a reasonable price in which we could buy back the Western Isles. 
a hack on successor Magnus realised that the gig was up and uh, he agreed to allow Alexander to buy back the Western Isles. So you've got Alexander, right? This guy's in his 20s. Um, he's just defeated the largest foreign army to try and invade Scotland. Uh, he's won back huge swathes of land. He's got complete control of his kingdom. He's got peace with the English. And he's just, he's just been given a male heir as well. But he's Scottish. So obviously, everything was inevitably about to go tits up. In 1275, uh, Mar uh, Alexander's wife Margaret died. Then in 1281, his youngest son David died. Then in 1283, his daughter Margaret, who by that point was the queen of Norway, she had married uh, Magnus's son Eric. She died in childbirth, giving birth to Margaret, the maid of Norway. And then in 1284, his eldest son Alexander died. Now that is a hell of a lot of coordinated dying. And it left poor Alexander without an heir. And so he remarried in 1285 uh, Yolanda de Montfort. And apparently, at Alexander and Yolanda's wedding reception, a skeleton could be seen dancing. Um, it was doing the mash. The monster mash. <laughs> Anyway, um, after his wedding, and it was a bleak, horrible March evening, uh, Alexander, he's at Edinburgh Castle meeting with his, curse, with his uh, council, and his wife Yolanda is in Kinghorn and Fife, and against the advice of his council, he rides out to meet his young wife. The weather was so bad that the boatsman at Queen's Ferry refused to take him across. He had, to, he had to bully him, shite bag if you didn't, that type of thing. So he gets on the other side to Fife, and in the snowstorm, Alexander gets separated from his men. And the next morning, he's found at the bottom of a cliff. And uh, he had basically ridden himself clean off of the cliff. It's probably not what he had in his mind when he set out from Edinburgh. I said he was going to ride himself to death, you know. But his death was a disaster. Because it meant that the heir to Scotland was now an infant child, Margaret, in Norway. Although, to be fair, a Scandinavian child is a better leader than a fully grown American man, you know. Um, incidentally, does anyone know where Boris Johnson was born? Yeah, I thought so. Really, the whole situation left Scotland in a terrible dynastic crisis, which we're going to tell you is all about next weekend. Thank you very much for listening. Cheers.